The New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and Art Beyond Sight present Project Access New York, Best Practices for Inclusion in the Arts, Thursday, May 2, 2013, the Museum of Modern Art. Five people are seated at a table on a stage in an auditorium for the panel Access Possibilities Through Emerging Technologies. The panelists from left to right are Duane Scott, Designer Evangelist, Shapeways, Scott Harmon, Vice President of Corporate Development, 3D Systems, Geomagic. Peter Adamczyk, Program Manager, Google Cultural Initiative. Andrea Durham, Director of Exhibits, Museum of Science, Boston. Nina Levent, Executive Director, Art Beyond Sight. So um, this is going to be more of a conversational session. I'm going to very briefly introduce the participants, and I'm sorry if I'm, no, I'm not going to read your wonderful bios there, all in the program. So next to me is uh, Andrea Durham, representing Museum of Science Boston. Andrea is a director of exhibits at the Museum of Science, leads its staff of 40 talented individuals, is responsible for the fabrication and execution of everything on view at the museum. And is here to talk a little bit about the newest project at Hackathon in addressing both accessibility and exhibits. Um, next to Andrea is uh, Peter Adamchuk, and Peter is here representing Google Art Project and Google Cultural Initiative. Is a computer scientist and an artist as well. So um, Scott Harmon is next. Um, Scott Harmon is representing 3D Systems and Geomagic. Am I correct? Um, is a vice president of corporate development. Has a background in both microelectronics and management. Um, with the degrees from, from um, United States Military Academy and, and um, Harvard Business School. And um, so I hope you'll talk a little bit about Manchester Museum and some, some of the virtual touch projects. I think we all are eager to hear about those. And um, Duane is our last presenter, um, is here representing Shapeways. Um, Duane is both industrial des designer, writer, and researcher specializing in, um, um, in issues related to the democratization of product design through online digital fabrication, which Shapeways is the company that does it. And um, Duane du um, works to promote 3D printing community in the marketplace and make users, um, creators, as well as consumers of, um, um, of objects. So, with that, Andrea, take it away. I have a PowerPoint that we can queue up, please. PowerPoint slides begin on a large screen behind the panelists. Slide one, title, Creating Museum Media for Everyone. I hope. So I will preface my, uh, thank you, I will preface my presentation by saying this is a high-tech panel, but the Museum of Science has been developing, uh, working to develop universally designed exhibits for over 20 years now. And the majority of those have been very low-tech developments that have advanced us in this area. And so, you know, I'm happy to answer questions afterward or, or um, however that works to answer any questions you may have on some of our other approaches. But I'm going to use today as an example, I'm going to use a fairly well-funded project um, that we are grateful to have received funding from the National Science Foundation to do some more cutting-edge technology development. Our concern in the museum field is that as museums increasingly use and embrace touch screens, they're not often uh, accessible to all audiences, and since we're very high, so committed to being accessible to all visitors who come in our institution, also um, alone with families, we serve everybody from infancy to 100 years of age, and so um, we use uh, various techniques to do that, but um, we try to avoid touch screens, but other museums um, have really embraced that technology, and multi-touch screens are gaining uh, a lot more interest in museums. And so our concern, our, this project grew out of our concern for that, and our desire to lead the field in providing the field with ways that those particular technologies can be used by everyone. So I will dive in. There we go. So this is our, our goal at the Museum of Science is to, uh, kind of what I just said, but I'll read it for those of you who would prefer that, 
Further the, field's sorry. Further the field's capacity to design, develop, and implement innovative digital interactives for science museum exhibitions that engage people with and without disabilities in informal science learning. And as I said, we have been funded by, for many initiatives by the National Science Foundation, and part of the reason for that is that they're heavily committed to this area, and they know that once they've provided funding for something like this, our obligation is to disseminate it to the field because it was funded by all of your tax dollars. So the, I'm sorry, this is awkward. I usually have my laptop in front of me, so. Slide, title, Project Rationale. The project starts with the premise that one, the flexibility of information technologies make them ideally suited for reaching a broad range of visitors. Two, knowledge exists about accessible technologies outside the museum field that can be modified to meet the needs of museums. Three, information technologies employed in most museums are inaccessible to many visitors. Therefore, the museum field needs new tools and approaches for designing and developing digital interactives. The basic premise of the project is that we know that we have expertise in-house, but it's limited by our staff's knowledge. We know that there's a lot of expertise out in the field, both within the disabilities community, within the high-tech community, within the university environment, within pl places like WGBH, who I'm sure all of you are familiar with there work in this area and so we decided that the approach on this project would be to really involve all of those people and get our heads together and tap into that knowledge to come up with a great end result. As I said before, also the field needs these tools and techniques. Somebody needs to invest the money in developing them and then disseminate them to everyone and so that's a key goal of the project. In the interest of time, I'm going to gloss over the goals because I think I already gave you a good overview. So the project partners that I just mentioned, I don't want to leave anybody out. I mentioned WGBH. IDM is also an, very active in this area. They're based out of Albuquerque, and they're doing a lot of work in the multi-touch screen technologies. And we heavily relied on a wide range of participants from the disability community. We have a, we're fortunate that we have been developing those relationships over 20 years. And so we have the people we can call. And we don't just use them on a project by project basis. We, use, we tap into that knowledge a lot. We invite them into the museum. We do walkthroughs on a regular basis to just see what improvements we can make. But on this particular project, they've really committed to spending some time with us. The area that we decided to focus on is an exemplar digital interactive that will um, be particularly useful for data manipulation. Slide, title, products, exemplar digital interactive, audio description layer for multi-touch tables, multiple papers, there are four, personalization in museum environments, how visitors with disabilities use digital interactives, development process for inclusive interactives, using personas to develop inclusive interactives. Toolkit for building your own interactive. We have identified data manipulation as uh, something that's difficult to achieve on a touch screen and for people with visual impairments. So we decided that that would be something that could be applied broadly in the field. Slide. Title. Project process. Point one. Planning project and workshop. Two. Collaborative interdisciplinary workshop called UD Hackathon or Design Charette. Three. Developing prototype interactives, exemplar exhibit. Four, summative evaluation. Five, dissemination of tools and process. The process revolved around first making sure that people had a baseline knowledge of the, t the, so we had a common knowledge base to start with. But then the bulk of the project revolved around what we called a hackathon which um, was a new term for me, any of you in software, I'm sure it's not anything novel for you, but we decided to have an intensive five-day work workshop where everybody would really be highly collaborative, and our ambitious goal was that by Friday we would actually have prototypes that people could use. Slide, title, Possibilities Workshop, point one, 
sharing expertise from different areas. 2. Developing common understanding and language. 3. Expert presentations. 4. Small and large group discussion. So this is the opening um, knowledge sharing workshop, which we call the possibilities workshop, to start to get people inspired about what, we might, what might be possible in a week. And then we did the group, um, the bulk of the week was the actual hands-on work. We divided into four main goal groups that were centered around a goal. One group decided that they were going to work on data sonification, obviously uh, um, adding an audio layer to the data. One was on haptic, one was working on a haptic feedback, which obviously they had expertise already on haptic controls in that group. Another, a third group worked on audio layer for multi-touch. And a fourth group worked on a personal, some personalization techniques for those visitors who do, we, we were exploring technologies that we could use um, that would automatically personalize our exhibits for a visitor who came in and self-identified as wanting particular accommodations. So the workshop process, in the interest of time, I will let you know that there will be um, ways that we will be disseminating some of this information. So I'm going to go pretty fast through the workshop si slides. Slide. Title, Prototyping Workshop, Four Small Groups, Data Sonification, Haptic Feedback, Audio Layer on Multi-Touch, Personalization. Each group included multiple areas of expertise, exhibit development, programming, tech design, universal design, education, disability advisor. But we basically just tried to prepare by having a lot of resources available. And that ranged everywhere from glue guns to coffee to, to boards, Arduinos, you know, the whole, we tried to have a, a whole storehouse of technologies that people could play with. Here's one of the prototypes that was, is being tested by a user. Slide. Title, Product Datification. A photo of a man looking down at a tabletop prototype that looks like a large tray. This was a tactile, it ended up, it's very rough because remember we only had like three days to do this. So it was a, it's a tactile grid that um, replicates a graph that um, a person with sight would see graph paper, but a person without sight can, can feel it tactful, tactile e. Obviously anybody, that's the point of universal design, anybody can experience this in a tactile way. And then what's going to happen is the computer is going to actually move the X and Y axes so that you can find the data point. As a user, you could feel, literally feel the data point on that graph. Slide, title, product, haptic feedback. A photo of a man touching another tabletop prototype. Here's the haptic interface that was developed, which basically the data, in a nutshell, the data points will give you positive haptic feedback as you scan over a graph. We've been working on adding the, the audio layer to multi-touch tables, and we actually had a working prototype by the end of the week. You can imagine not very many participants got much sleep, so um, there was a lot of all-night programming going on, which was a lot of fun for those of us who were not doing the programming. And the personalization group, you can see, did a lot of brainstorming. Slide. Title. Product Personalization. The personalization group at work. And so I just have some lessons learned as a wrap-up here. Slide. Title. Lessons learned from running the hackathon and workshop. There are five points. One, intensive workshops which bring many people together and challenge them to be creative can lead to new and interesting ideas. Two, Participants need common background information. Three, people with disabilities should be included in the design process from the beginning. Four, personas can be a useful tool for keeping end users in mind. Five, varying forms of documentation are important for project and dissemination purposes. That, uh, that an, an intensive workshop where we really collaborate and put people's knowledge together proved to be challenging, but, but very beneficial to the participants. We got very, very positive feedback. We do need to, you need to start with making sure everybody has enough common background to work together. People with disabilities need to be involved from the very beginning of the process and throughout. We got amazing, amazing feedback. 
Personas were something we used extensively to prepare the group for understanding um, areas of the disability community, people within the disability community that they were less familiar with. And we're going to be doing a lot of project dissemination that I'm sure you can hear more about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end and thank you and the NSF. <laughs> So hi everyone. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to speak uh, this morning a little bit, but um, just to give you a better sense of uh, some of the technology that we're working on both within um, the art project, the cultural institute, and leveraging a bit more of the resources that Google can bring to bear um, when um, it approaches kind of the cultural sector. Um, the art project really it's three part. There's three parts to the whole. Um, you have the images that come from the institutions along with their metadata and that makes up the bulk of the art project. Um, those are images that are already uh, taken by the institutions generally for insurance purposes, really high resolution, high quality images. Um, we hope for 4,000 pixels or better on a side. Some institutions, they've got no trouble providing 40,000 pixels at a time. I mean, it, it very you know, large images that provide a lot of zooming capability. Um, another component is the gigapixel. Um, we come in um, with a special camera and take a super high resolution um, photograph of one piece. In MoMA's case, it's Starry Night. I think the capture took 12, 14 hours. Um, basically, it's a, a camera on a gimbal that takes really high resolution snapshots and stitches them all back together. Um, it's a bit of a whiz-bang sort of fancy technology thing. Um, there's a bit of curatorial and, of course, conservation value. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of um, interest on the part of the institution to see what's possible with that kind of resolution. Um, you can see, of course, of course, brush stroke level detail um, and feel uh, the physicality and materiality of the painting in a different way than you can from just a, a little thumbnail uh, or even a, a larger scale image. Um, but that's another component. And the third is the street view. Um, the street view component is where we send a trolley. Um, that's essentially the same as the street view technology that um, you can see in Google Maps, but do it in a physical space inside. Um, the institution lets us know where they'd like us to be, um, and then blurs out any uh, copyright protected works or security concerns or anything like that. But then um, they're able to let us know the floor plan that they'd like us to cover. Um, of course, there's no cost of, to participate in the project and so on. Um, I just mentioned this. Um, there's sometimes people get the wrong impression that either Google's paying or that the institutions pay to participate. It's entirely for free. We're happy to work with anyone if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, the Cultural Institute platform more broadly, we're working with libraries and archives and trying to get that material online as well. Um, so that started with projects with the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Yad Vashem, um, kind of getting more text-based material online. And that's where some of the um, rest of Google services really come in handy. <clears throat> the um, text scanning and the automatic translation services that we can um, sometimes bring to bear are really useful in those cases. Um, YouTube videos that sometimes come from the partners, um, those you can also create automatic transcripts um, based on voice recognition in the videos and then translate those into other languages. We've had mixed responses there. Um, some institutions are really happy just to be able to provide content even though it may not be precise. Um, in other languages just to be able to reach those audiences, um, whereas others are very much more about if we can't provide the same kind of nuanced um, curatorial language in all of these languages, we'd prefer not to at all. Um, and of course, we leave it up to the institution, but um, using these tools, of course, they're all open, so it's easy enough to send the, the text through and, and see what kind of results you get. Um, it is specialized vocabulary, and I think that's the most difficult problem when it comes to translations and also text-to-speech. Um, in both of those cases. And the more speculative uh, material has to do more with mobile technology. Um, the possibilities that you have when... Um, Excuse me? Mm -hmm. The captioner is not hearing you. Okay. So can you just of course. Sure. Um, the more speculative um, sort of technology that we're working with is more the mobile um, technology where um, we're trying to find experiences that might uh, work for people that are either uh, not in the museum or uh, are uh, choosing to experience the institution through their device rather than physically. 
Um, those that you'll see, kind of, the, whether they be teenagers or people who just feel more comfortable at this point dealing with the screen rather than with the group that they're visiting the museum with. Um, thinking about ways that augmented uh, reality might apply in these spaces as well as haptic feedback, um, touch, um, especially as it relates to physical sculpture and um, the possibilities when you have uh, just the 3D object models of um, the piece rather than even an entire sculpture or reconstructions of that sculpture um, and the possibilities that come up there. But yeah, Thank I'd like you. to hand That's it over. Perfect segue. Scott. So I'm Scott Harmon. I work for a company called 3D Systems. Uh, we are the, go to the next uh, slide. Oh, sorry. There's the, I can go to the next slide. That would be great. All right. I'll go to the next slide. Slide. Title, Agenda, then four points. Intro to 3D printing and scanning. Making the physical accessible. Making that which is not physical, physical. Creating by touch. Um, the, I wanted to talk about a few things. 3D Systems is the, uh, is the first and largest manufacturer of this thing called a 3D printer. And my sense is that uh, some of you have probably heard of that. Some have not. Uh, we get comments all the time that a 3D printer is the worst uh, description for these things that ever existed. Um, and so a 3D printer is not a printer that you print paper and then fold to get something 3D. A 3D printer actually makes physical objects directly from digital files. And, uh, and that has some pretty interesting uh, implications for accessibility uh, for people with disabilities that I'll tell you about. So the, um, we talk about what 3D printing is and what scanning is. Uh, why that's important to, uh, to this particular audience and some applications uh, that have arisen uh, that I think you'll get a kick out of. Slide, title, tools. Photos of various 3D printing units. So fundamentally, a 3D scanner takes a photograph of something, but instead of making it into a flat image, it actually has depth. It has surface. Um, it actually displays all the dimensionality of the thing that you've captured. And so you're basically, just like an MP3 file is a digital representation of a song, a 3D scan is a digital representation of a physical object or a physical space. A 3D printer can then take that representation, that digital representation, and turn it back to physical reality. And so what you have is you have a way of going from physical reality to a digital reality back to a physical reality. And as a result of the, 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 the decrease in price of these kinds of systems, we can now do that uh, at a very, very low cost, which is exciting for a few different reasons, which I'll, uh, I'll explain. Uh, so first, uh, this is the Smithsonian uh, Institute. Slide. Title, Scan to Print. Showing two photos of archaeological artifacts. Uh, they actually have an office of digitization now. Uh, and we're, again, we're not talking about 2D digitization, we're talking about 3D digitization. And so what you see up here is actually a whalebone fossil from South America. And before they pulled it out of the ground, they used 3D scanning technology to capture that in virtual form. Uh, and so uh, there's basically a surface that is a representation of that whalebone. And with that, we can then 3D print a replica in color. And so people who might never, not ever get to see that fossil, because whether they pull it out of the ground or put it into a single museum, now we can create replicas of that that we can show anywhere in the world. We can create digital replicas that people can zoom in and explore so they can do it through a website. We can create physical replicas so people who don't have sight can actually use their hands to explore what these things feel like. And because it's a replica and not the original, we can make that accessible to anyone pretty much anywhere. And again, because the tools have become so much less expensive than they used to be, we can do that at a cost that's, uh, that's pretty exciting and affordable for, uh, for museums. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier the University of Manchester. Slide, title, Scan to Learn to Print. Various 3D scans of sculptural heads from the University of Manchester. Uh, this is interesting. You've got a, um, a mummy over there. And interestingly, there are technologies that don't just capture the surface. We can actually use CT scanners to capture the internal geometry of an object, the same way that you get an X-ray or an MRI. And so now we can not just look at the surface, but we can allow people both visually and with their hands to explore the interior of objects that nobody would have seen before. Um, and we also have tools and techniques for then building back from that data information that may have been interesting, anthropomorphological data about what that person looked like or uh, how they might have met their end or whatever else. Um, and again, these kinds of tools have become much more accessible as well. So uh, haptics came up a few minutes ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a haptic device is, 
a haptic device, uh, if you're holding a pen and operating in 3D space, the pen is actually pushing back when you touch things. So if I were moving the pen over top of the surface of that whale bone, the pen would actually move as I rubbed across those various bones. So again, people who don't have sight can feel in a digital environment in ways that were not possible that long ago. Slide, title, Digital to Physical. On the left, a photograph of a woman. On the right, a tactile reproduction of the photo. Uh, this is another thing that you can do with a 3D printer. So there's some content that's already digital, uh, but that is not really accessible. So a, a two-dimensional image, for instance, um, is fantastic if you have sight, but if you don't have sight, then it's, it's hard to kind of figure out. What we can do is we can take the color in that image and we can extrude the color. So the darker parts will make thicker and the thinner part, the, the lighter parts will make thinner. And so you can now get a, a physical representation that you can feel based on a two-dimensional image. And again, you can open up accessibility so that things that may not have made sense before, um, flowers and buildings and faces, can now be experienced in, uh, in new ways with, for, for people who, uh, who, who have disabilities. Uh, this is the haptic device, another super exciting technology and another way for people to interact with their physical world in a way that wasn't possible that long ago. So Slide. now once we've captured Title. something Haptics. digitally, Photo of a hand we using a haptic pen object near a computer screen. to interact with it in, in physical space. And so, again, when you think about trying to describe the Colosseum to someone, we can now capture the Colosseum in digital space and give people uh, either a 3D model that they could feel with their hands or actually a digital tool for going in and exploring it haptically. So uh, these technologies, again, they've been around for a long time, but what's happened is only recently they've become cost accessible. And so museums and heritage groups and things like that uh, can now put them into their space and use the output from these devices, capture their collection and digitize them, and then release it to the whole world, um, frankly, whether it's in, you know, uh, for, for disabled people or for even just regular people. So that's what I have. Thank you. I also have a slide deck of images. Yeah. Uh, my name is Duan. I'm from Shapeways. We're an online 3D printing um, marketplace and community. Slide. Title, What is 3D Printing? 3D printing is a catch-all phrase for a number of additive manufacturing technologies, formerly known as rapid prototyping for engineers, to test physical models prior to manufacture. Decrease in cost of 3D printers and 3D printing with increase in quality of materials has made 3D printing viable for medium-run products. Uh, I guess first, as you said, what is 3D printing? It's a, it used to be called rapid prototyping. It was a way for engineers and designers to test a product before taking it to market. And as you've mentioned, the price has come down and the materials have got better to the point we can have finished products instead of just prototypes. Um, it is weird not having a slip. Slide. Title, 3D Printing Technologies. A list of acronyms for various 3D printing technologies. Uh, it, it encases a lot of technologies that we call 3D printing. There's laser sintering of nylons. There's um, direct metal laser sintering. There's powder-based printing. There's lots of different technologies. We're using this term, 3D printing, because it's easier. It's not the, maybe not the best term, but it's stuck, and we're using it now. But it's, don't just think of plastic or of plaster, but it's also stainless steel, sterling silver, ceramics, um, gold, like it's lots of materials in lots of complex forms. The great thing about 3D printing is you can have something very, very complex and it's no additional cost for something that's very, very simple. And when you have complexity for free, you can have customization for free. So you can make something for anybody um, specifically for a single person or for a specific use with no additional cost. But how does this work for museums and educational institutions? As I said, Shapeways is an online 3D printing marketplace, a place where anyone can upload a file, print it, and have it sent to them or even sell that product. So an institution could have a range of their artefacts for sale on Shapeways, and we can print it on demand, send them to your buyers, and if you want, you can make revenue from it. And that's If you want to talk about that, you can come and see me afterwards. But um. Slide. Title, What Does a Calculus Surface Look Like? A list of calculus formulas for various objects, including an elliptical cone, a sphere, an ellipsoid. This is calculus. Does anybody know math? No, me neither. Does anyone, is anyone who's blind know math and parabolic equations? Um, Z equals plus SQRT 2RY bracket 2X 
to power why it means nothing to you if you can't see what it means but um we can print that equation so that someone who's blind can understand it a bit better slide photos of 3d objects created from the calculus formulas and this is what they look like and it's cheap you know this is probably this is probably about you know ten dollars worth of 3d printing for for your class or your your, your students to understand exactly what these things mean, what a parabolic surface is. Um, and it helps me to understand, because if I say that equation, I see nothing. But any, everyone, and it's, so it's not just for blind people, it's for everyone to sort of understand what these things are. <laughs> everyone knows what a ball is. <laughs> but now you can see the equation and the ball. And any other complex things, like what's a, what's a Koch um, triangle, or what's a, what's a Silbert surface, or what's a... Um, what, 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 does, what does a fractal look like for someone who's blind? It would be near impossible. But now they can, they can see it in three, they can see it with their hands, they can feel it, a tactile representation of that form. And, uh, like a, and this opens up better ways to understand things, like the, the purest form is math, because, you know, it's an equation. But everything else we can understand as well. And we can make these complex forms, and we can also add... Um, details to make it even easier for people who are visually impaired to see. Slide. Photographs of 3D figures. On the left, a hyperbola, with its calculus equation printed on the side in letters and in braille. On the right, photos of 3D objects, including a virus and the moon. So this is a um, mathematic equation with braille embedded into it. So as well as understanding the equation, they can see the equation in braille, fill it in text. And this is good for everybody, not just for those visually impaired, but for any student who wants to understand it. They can see it straight away. We can also do things like um, 3D print a, a virus gene. Like, what does herpes look like? There it is in the bottom corner. What does the moon look like? How can a blind person ever know that unless they feel it in a tactile form? This is a 3D scan of the moon printed out. Exactly. You know, it's a great way to, to, to learn about nature and science. Slide. Photos of 3D objects created with braille printing on them, including a silver ring, a Rubik's Cube, and a model of a city. We can also embed braille in anything. Because we can customize things, it doesn't cost any extra to add braille or any other sort of communication into an object. So you can have a ring with braille in it. You can have a Rubik's Cube with braille in it so the visually impaired can have that same joy of being frustrated by a toy. We can do city maps. We can do landscapes. We can print anything. Like, what other way would, it, would can we understand the world around us um, so easily? And it's relatively inexpensive. Um, you can artifacts that would be otherwise, you know, too expensive to put into people's hands because it's fragile. We can we can print out. Slide photos of a white 3D artifact about the size of your hand. Uh, what I have here is a. 3D scan of a hominid from between 2.1 and 1.2, I'm going to say million, it could have been billion, years ago. Now we can print this, this is a scan from um, africanfossils.org of a hominid. We can print this with the exact same mass as the original artifact by changing the density internally and give people a chance to really feel the object. And um, it's strong, you know. It's, it's not going to break. And we can pass it around and everyone can have a go and, and feel what it's like. And it's a way to communicate these things which would otherwise be too precious to, to hand out to everybody. But we can give this to a school kids and they won't destroy it. It's can perfect. Um, <laughs> no, you can't, unfortunately. <laughs> I might be able to print you a smaller one. But, but you can, you know, it's, it's simple. It's an easy way to get, to get access to these, this tool. And there's a lot of ventures now going through scanning like the Smithsonian have their um, digitisation um, unit and uh, there's lots of independent people looking to scan artifacts around the world. The, the Met had something recently where they had people scanning it and printing it out and releasing the files for free download so anyone can print it at their home machine or with a service like Shapeways or with their own school's printer. But it's an easy way for people to access and learn through the physical object, through touch. The, the one thing that is difficult is how to create 3D objects if you are visually impaired, because most things are done by the screen. A haptic device is a way to sort of in interface with the virtual world to make a physical object. Um, 
but we need more. We need ways for people to gesturally make things, how, how people can modify, um, manipulate, or design from scratch. And there's some hacks going on using things like the Connect or other um, ways to capture 3D data and convert it into 3D models. There's also free tools like 123D Catch by Autodesk, we can take about 40 photographs of an object. It'll get stitched together into an almost printable file. You'll still need someone who's, um, who can see to manipulate that file in the computer because we're in the world of screens. Slide. Photos of a hand wearing a haptic glove. Over the headline, Missing Tactile Design Interface. But there's, there is more experimental, experimental things happening, like haptic gloves. So instead of just having a, a single uh, pencil point to try and interact with the virtual world, you can have a glove and you can feel that virtual world. And that'll help people to uh, have like a virtual clay to sculpt a form and then print it out. So there's, there's a lot to be done. It's, it's a very starting point as the prices have come down recently. But um, there's so much potential for how to learn through touch, through 3D printing. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a question or two if there is uh, if there are questions. Yes, just speak up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the question is, can, um, can we make fashion design with, with the 3D printing machines? And yes, we're seeing what that happen more and more. It's, at the moment, it's at the more experimental edge, but it's definitely possible. And as new materials are released, which are more flexible and fabric-like, you'll see more of that happening. And if your, um, your contact doesn't have the 3D modeling skills, we can help um, connect them with someone who can 3D model, like a digital craftsperson, to help them realize their ideas. And it's happening a lot right, recently. So, yes. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Um, this is for Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you only work with large cultural institutions or if you work with the smaller nonprofits. The more eager, the better, regardless <laughs> of size. <laughs> um, we've found sometimes larger institutions are difficult to navigate, and sometimes the smaller ones are just ready to go. Um, they might have had a digitization grant, and they have all of this content, and no way to really kind of get it out there, so they, they look to us for that. Um, but yeah, certainly it's, it's size isn't the issue, it's much more um, staff readiness and familiarity with kind of digital tools. Title, www.projectaccessforall.org. Copyright, Project Access for All, 2013.